Hello and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell story, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. If you can believe it, the cult classic movie Scott Pilgrim vs. The World came out just a little over 10 years ago. And to celebrate the anniversary, the filmmakers have decided to remix and remaster the film in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos and re-release it into theaters and bring out a new home video version this year. Luckily for us, as this is the Dolby Institute podcast, we were able to score interviews with both the director, Edgar Wright, and the film's sound designer, Julian Slater. Edgar sat down with my colleagues at Dolby's office in London a few weeks ago to discuss the re-release, and the conversation was so good we wanted to share some excerpts from it with you today. Let's take a listen. You know, with Scott Pilgrim, really, obviously, the kind of the the real genius behind it all is Brian Lee O'Malley, who wrote and, and drew the books. And when I first read the first book in 2004, it was right after Shaun of the Dead had come out, I was immediately taken with it. And just the idea of like bringing that story and those visuals to life like really appealed to me. And I guess in a way, when I read the book, it reminded me of the TV show Spaced that I'd done. But there's sort of, it was a way through the story of Scott Pilgrim to take that style and make it a lot bigger. And also, I feel like at the time, the sort of vogue was to make comic book movies look more realistic and sort of darker. And everybody was going in the direction of like Chris Nolan to make sort of comic book films like gritty and dark and real and tough. And the great thing about Scott Pilgrim, because it wasn't a superhero story and the outrageousness of it and the sort of magical realism was part of the movie it was just like a license to make it as like colorful and as as fun and as pop arty as the books were so that was just an opportunity for me is that i i could make a comic book movie that wasn't ashamed to be a comic book movie so you could use all of those sound effects and 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 uh, both you know use like sort of comic book sound effects and video game effects and and do it in a way where you were deliberately making it stylized that was a really fun thing to do because i think for a long time sort of like it felt like comic book movies were trying to um you know um leave behind the legacy of the adam west tv batman series and pow and like blam and stuff was uh was was to be um oh you know that's that's old comic book movies check out this dark and gritty interpretation so the idea of actually sort of try, like being able to go back and make something that was more almost like a, a 60s film, although it's very modern, just but let's, so you could just embrace all of those aspects, that was a real gift. The idea to re-release Scott Pilgrim had come from two sort of directions. I think I had thought of it out loud because the 10th anniversary was looming and, and the film had sort of never gone out of release. <laughs> it had sort of, you know, one of the nice things about the movie is that when it first came out, it kind of underperformed like commercially, but at the same time, it never left cinemas. So it was always a very um, pleasing thing to me is it sort of seemed to become a cult movie like a month after it had left theaters. Well, I say it never, in, in some places, it never left the theaters. I feel like in the States, there are prints of Scott Pilgrim from 2010 that have just been in circulation ever since. And that was a very nice thing to me is that it's, I guess it's like the immediate measure of like a cult movie is that it it, it starts to pick up its own um, following, but it also is, is, is not sort of really conforming to any like um conventional measure of success and the and the weird thing with scott pilgrim is that you know it didn't kind of like break through in a, in a big way initially but then very quickly became a cult item where suddenly it was like on the midnight circuit and suddenly it was like sort of playing in different cinemas around the states or in the uk and other places uh in canada like was just playing quite regularly and in some places like playing like once a week so and every now and again, I'll go down and do like a QA and a and, and sort of surprise people to do an intro and it, and it happens a lot. So it's, I think out of my movies, it feels like, it feels like m- my movie that's been 
seen the most at the cinema since it came out, which is unusual because like other films have been bigger hits, but like sort of, but Scott Pilgrim never stopped playing. So I think as the 10th anniversary loomed and like there's this kind of, um, you know, uh, what can we do? And like one of the things having after Scott Pilgrim done like Dolby Atmos with like Baby Driver and Last Night in Soho, it's like, well, why don't we remaster Scott Pilgrim in Dolby Vision? you know, in, in 4K, in like sort of uh, Dolby Atmos. And so I mentioned the idea to Universal, uh, to Michael Moses, head of marketing, who's always been one of the biggest champions of the movie. And uh, he was like, that, that's a great idea. Let me speak to Dolby straight away. And they came back and said, we'd love that. So it was like, it was, um, it met with no resistance <laughs> whatsoever. Everybody was totally into the idea. And also the good news is, is that unusually for something like this, like I still work with the mixer, uh, you know, uh, Julian Slater has done all my subsequent movies. Um, you know, Stephen Nakamura, who was the colorist on it and Bill Pope, I still work with those guys. So what was great is we were able to do this new version with the original team and that was fantastic, you know? So it was actually a pleasure, like sometimes like kind of going back into remastering something can be a bit of a chore or like you have to find all the assets and stuff. But in this case, it was, it was actually a very sweet reunion because it was, you know, I went with the same editor, you know, uh, and so I sat in this literal theater watching the Dolby Cinema version with the editor of the movie and the sound mixer of the movie 10 years later and watching it. And I had like no notes. It was like so such a pleasure because it's such an easy experience because it's like, well, it sounds and looks better than it ever has done. And what better way to celebrate 10 years of this movie? and replace the the maybe slightly ratty 35 mil prints that are going around and around <laughs> the thing that i'm really struck by with that movie and I, listen i can't i, I don't want to sound cocky or anything so I, i'll give the full credit to like bill pope who shot the movie and marcus rowlands the production designer and fraser churchill who did the vfx i mean it's it's shocking to me when i watch it that it's like 10 years old because it seems to me really sort of like quite startling and fresh. And I think sort of like visually, I you know, for something that's like a decade old now, there's very little in it that feels dated to me at all. I feel like it's still sort of like just um, some of Bill's best work. I think it just looks extraordinary. And so to see it in this new kind of like version was just like a pleasure because I just think it looks and sounds better than it ever has done before. I think that, you know, the sound mix of, of Scott Pilgrim was always a very sophisticated, dynamic mix. And, you know, having done, you know, um, three films with Julian Slater since, including one that he got Oscar nominated for, it was just great to go back and like see how much further we could push it really. So I think it will be something like, I think also if, if it's something where you've only ever seen Scott Pilgrim on TV or like on, you know, Blu-ray or something, it would be a great experience to see it on a big screen with all the bells and whistles. Many thanks to Edgar Wright for nerding out with us once again. If you want to hear a longer conversation with Edgar and his frequent collaborator and sound designer, Julian Slater, we sat down a couple of years ago with them on this very podcast to discuss both Baby Driver and their long-term uh, collaboration across several different films. You can find that episode by searching our recent archives for episode number 24. Next up, we are once again joined by Julian Slater, Edgar's longtime sound designer and now mixer who recently had the joy and maybe the terror of dusting off and opening up those old Pro Tools sessions from over 10 years ago for Scott Pilgrim vs. The World in order to remix the film in Dolby Atmos. How much has actually changed from the original movie? Let's find out. Uh, Julian, thank you for uh, taking some time today to talk to us about the uh, the re-release of Scott Pilgrim. And uh, I know I'm, I'm looking at you. I, I know you're you're working. You're on stage at Warner Brothers mixing. So we really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us about the film. No problem. Thank you for thank you for asking me. Absolutely. Well, you know, obviously, it's not every movie that gets a 10th anniversary re-release. Uh, with this much anticipation and people, you know, having so much interest in going back and revisiting um, a film. Why do you think Scott Pilgrim has continued to 
kind of resonate with people and, uh, and, and kind of generate the amount of interest that the film still has after all this time? Gosh, I don't know. I, I do know that I was, sh- sh- you know, we, I was based in, I'm now based here in LA and I was based in London when uh, we did the movie and we released it. And um, I had no sense of the scale of appreciation for it as a movie until I came here. And the first thing that people would say to me when I meet them, not the first thing, but when we start talking about work, they go, you did Scott Pilgrim. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I love that movie. For several years, it kind of wasn't on my radar as something that was love that much until i got here and then um you know obviously there's a existing fan base for it but what's interesting is that there's a new i i have found there's a whole new fan base because i have two boys age eight and ten they completely love the movie in fact most of the sound crew now have kids of that age group and they're all in love with the movie so i think it's a mixture of um you know, people from 10 years ago who appreciate it as much as they did. And then there's a whole new fan base for, for, you know, the younger generation coming through because there's nothing, there's nothing offensive in it. It's all, it's still really fresh. It's still, you know, it's still, it's still something that's pretty exciting to watch. So, um, I guess it's a mixture, a mixture of the two things. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I think the film is really fresh. I watched it again a few nights ago just to, to kind of prepare for our conversation. And I'm surprised at how well it's aged. There's really nothing. Yeah. There's nothing anachronistic about it. I mean, I guess it's a little weird that there are no iPhones in it, but it's still it's still a hundred percent. I think. Yeah, the the phones are the only thing that date it, as far as I'm concerned. There's no, I mean, uh, you know, I've gone back and watched a few movies from ten years ago, and you're like, ooh, that 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 wouldn't fly these days, you know. Um, and also, there's a lot of there's an awful lot of practical stuff in there as well. It's not, you know, the 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 VFX are very heightened, obviously. Um, but they still totally stand up. In fact, I was saying to Edgar when we were talking about this at the back end of last year, you know, things like the Katanyagi twins, you know, that set was a real set with those lights and them coming up. You know, it wasn't all VFX. I mean, I know the the battling monsters were, but um, I think it's a mixture of, it is timeless because of, you know, the VFX holding up on their own merit and such a large amount of practical stuff. So yeah, it, it hasn't aged at all apart from, you know, I had to explain to my boys what a BlackBerry was because they got no, got no idea. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, listening to the film, the sound effects now, it, there's there's a lot of nostalgia for the BlackBerry sounds and, you know, the Nintendo and the game sounds. And, and um, you know, what... Uh, I, I'm curious was, did, did Edgar know specifically what kind of sound effects, if you can remember, cause I know it's been a long time, but what were the creative conversations that you guys had before you went in and did the film originally? Was, was Edgar really specific about the kind of sound effects that he wanted in it? Or did you kind of have free reign in the beginning to, to do your thing? Um, with most Edgar things, I would say that's a yes and no answer. He knew all the specific things like Nokia uh, or BlackBerry were in the Avid and he knew what he wanted to use. Um, Other than that, all the game sounds um, are pretty much all created from scratch. We knew going into it that there was no chance of getting clearance for all those, um, and I say game sounds, like for example, um, uh, the Matthew Patel fight, you know, when he's punching as they go up in the air and you've got the high score things that that's all stuff that sounds like it's from a video game but it's not it's all being generated afresh so we spent um you know and there's a a, a bunch of very incredible people who i will be name checking throughout this interview please do. jimmy Boyle being the jimmy Boyle being the first who spent you know days um manufacturing fresh game sounds that were of the of the um era of what we were looking for but um we had complete control over so and julian let me ask you were you did you have to recreate game sounds was that primarily a clearance issue or was it a fidelity issue that you wouldn't be able to get really high high fidelity recordings uh, or versions of those sound effects i think it must have been a clearance i don't ever recall actually having a conversation with say Nara, the producer, or 
Edgar about getting clearance for X, Y, and Z at all. But I was aware that there was so much, if we were to clear everything that we wanted to use, the budget would never hold it and the time it would take. And so just from very early on, it was it was never even a discussion. I think, um, and this is where my memory kind of fails me, but I I know that there are only a few actual game sounds used in the movie, like the Sonic the Hedgehog ring ping was was one of them um but other than that i from the very outset we approached it with okay let's recreate everything from scratch and there are a few like um plugins chip, chip sounds i think was one at the time something called chip sounds which you could you know make a few things but jimmy being jimmy he found this guy in canada i think it was who'd made a synthesizer out of, uh, out of an old atari st console and so he had that import, he, he bought it on eBay, had it shipped over and then just spent days coming up with loads of weird and wonderful eight bit sounds. And, and funny talking about the quality the the thing about, we did try with the punches to use uh, pure chip sound punch sounds, but that became very um, obvious very early on that that didn't cut it. And then we had to kind of blend it with real punches and, um, there's a lot of beatbox punches in the movie. A lot yeah. of Jimmy Boyle on a on a microphone, kind of going. <laughs> um, so it was always a blend. It was a blend of different things. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I love about this movie and the approach to the sound um, that you and Edgar kind of kind of arrived at is, you know, the the style of it being so heavily influenced by the visual art of the of the of the cartoons of the, you know, of, of the, the comic books, uh, really lent itself to such a creative approach to the sound design. And, and I, I we have a, an interview with Edgar and he had a great quote when he said, this movie has several sequences where people are literally having sonic battles. So tell me about, you know, when the movie first came to you, what was your, I'm sure you must've been very excited at the possibilities for creative sound design because the the movie visually, lends itself to that right yeah it's you know it's funny you saying that i've never that's never really occurred to me about sonic battles that until until you say that but of course there are there are several that are sonic battles um i remember and i'm not just paying lip service i remember seeing the first cut of the movie because i had seen nothing i had a i had a uh, i think maybe a meeting with edgar before the shoot where i came up with some like eight bit punch sounds for him to use on the set. Um, but I hadn't seen anything and day one roll up to the cutting rooms. And it was the, that was the first time that Edgar had requested that the sound team and the picture team all in the same building, um, which worked, which is well, not, that's another story, but that, that really helped the creative process, but just playing it. And even with the temp VFX, cause the VFX obviously took a while to come in, just being blown away at how, unique it was and how i had never seen anything like this before and so you obviously want to on one hand it makes it easier because there's such a strong visual um dynamic and visual presence and a style in one regard it makes it easier to follow that and come up with new stuff because you know you it's got a you know you're you're there's a very particular um visual um palette that you want to follow sure but equally when you see it for what it is and it's something that's so arresting and so unique the obviously the one wants to do something that is sonically unique as well so you know the pressure starts from day one and doesn't really <laughs> stop until you finish it it's kind of um, like it's yeah. kind of like you've always wanted this now here it is don't screw it up yeah exactly you know and um because up until that point, Edgar had done, you know, there was, it was the Cornetto trilogy, which were sonically very challenging and actually sonically very unique, as were the, those movies. But it was a very particular flavor. Um, no pun intended with the Cornetto joke. Um, but, um, but this was completely different. And so we knew that we had to do something completely different to 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 do it justice. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned previously that, um, that so much was practical and, and you know, Edgar shot it on set. I was struck again by how f uh, creative and fresh the transitions are between scenes. 
Um, like there's that one sequence I, I love right uh, towards the beginning of the movie where Scott Pilgrim goes to the bathroom um, and then comes out of the bathroom into the school hallway and then he's back into the house and then Ramona Flowers brings a package to him and it all plays out as like one continuous bit. But it's so, it's so, um, you know, and there's no visual trickery behind that. It's just really smooth, creative. Uh, yeah, it looks like practical stuff that I'm sure is digitally enhanced. But so it, it, it must have given you some really fun opportunities to um, to, again, echo that by being creative, but, you know, making it work with the visuals. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm becoming a bit of a broken record when I uh, when I'm asked about working with Edgar. But it's totally true. He sets up this kind of amazing world and infrastructure for someone like me to play in. He's he's already kind of identified, you know, how what he wants it to sound like. He gives you a good kind of st strong sense of where he wants it to go, and he and he's already in the his avid tracks are like the most com complicated avid tracks that I've ever seen. But within that, he's totally up for completely doing whatever and experimenting and having fun with it. And some things work, of course. Some things, sorry, some things don't work, of course. Uh, many things do, but it, but um, um, it, it's always born from his idea of where he wants this particular project to go, both visually and sonically. Yeah. So, I, and you know, that case in point, that was where I think Scott's playing. Um, there's a Zelda game playing, so it's Zelda music, music from Zelda that is then scored by Nigel Godrich that then goes into full score. So, right. you know, with with stuff like that, you're just kind of, you're at one point you're just hanging on to the coattails of of what is supposed to be happening sonically, and then you're trying to add your 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 five ten percent on top of it, and you just keep you know trying to add to it to to make it as as good as possible. Yeah. I'd love to ask you about your process of working with Edgar. Um, I know that, you know, you mentioned that you had done uh, uh, two or three movies with Edgar before Scott Pilgrim. Obviously, he's continued to work with you in the 10 years since. You guys have another movie coming out later this year, which we're all really looking yeah. forward to uh, last night in Soho. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, <clears throat> that you got that you read the script before he shot it. So at what point does he call you up and kind of how does it how does the the collaboration start on a new project between the two of you? I guess it kind of depends sometimes. Um, you know, we don't have much contact when he's not making a movie, but as soon as, uh, you know, we stay in contact with general chit chat about what's happened about the movie that we've just worked on. And then at some point he'll say, Hey, I should really send you the script for so-and-so not knowing that, yeah, that there is a script for such a project. And um, he's very kind. He, you know, he sends it along to me, and then he always asks what I think. Um, and so, uh, and that's a relationship I don't have with any other director to get it to to get an insight that early on. Um, Scott uh, Shaun of the Dead was slightly different because obviously that was his first movie. So um, uh, we met on that. I think he had interviewed several people, and there was something about um, you know how it went with with me and my team that same to chime and thank the Lord it, it, uh, it worked <laughs> out because it's been a very fruitful relationship since. So, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, having a relationship with a director over so many years means that you instinctively know what the target is and how to get to there. It just, it just makes for a much, and, and it, and I think I've said this before, it also means that you're not afraid to throw up suggestions that are potentially, could get shot down or are too crazy, too wild. You know, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing that I'm, I'm not afraid to present anything. Sure. With some directors, not that I'm afraid, but you know, when you work with a director for the first time, you've got to hedge your bets a little bit and, you know, and, and it's a working relationship to find your way about their sensibilities. But obviously when you've known someone for as long as I have with Edgar, you know, I just, I know exactly what it is that, um, I, I know, I know, I know that the 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 bandwidth of of what is what he's looking for. I I know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious. What was your reaction uh, when you found out that uh, that Edgar and Universal wanted to go back in and take a fresh look at Scott Pilgrim after all this time? 
I was overjoyed. I was totally overjoyed. And I was also overjoyed um, with Universal. I have to give them full respect because they gave me, I, you know, they said they asked me for a budget and I wanted to do it properly. I didn't want to, you know, just use stems and do a bit of this and a bit of that. You know, I went back to the units and in some areas kind of remixed it, but just, but, but obviously paying uh, a being between the original mix and this new Atmos mix. So th it was, it was I'm very happy that I was doing it. And then very happy again that Universal gave me the time to do it properly so that it could get its full day in the sun. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, can you talk a little bit about your creative approach to going back and remixing the film and reapproaching it in Dolby Atmos? I mean, it, it I, you know, the, the danger obviously is I think we've, we've, we all know some filmmakers who have gotten a little in trouble uh, for going back and kind of going, doing too much to the original pieces and changing them too much because these are obviously beloved by the fans. So how did you strike a balance between going back in and having access to this new technology to kind of reimagine some of these sequences uh, versus going too far with it? Well, content wise, nothing has changed. There's no new sounds. There's no replacing of sounds. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, I think we should have done this be this way the first time round. Um, but what I did want to do is, is um, make it a proper Atmos mix, not just a pseudo kind of, you know, a quick up. I didn't want it to be an up mix. I wanted an it to mix. be an Atmos sure. mix yeah. in its, in its own right. So um, I was, I was lucky in as much as, Obviously, Universal had the archives of all the deliverables, but the thing that I really wanted was the effects units. Yeah, so let me. So I, I want. I want to dig into this a little bit. So, so let me just stop yeah. you for a second. So, so what was archived at Universal? Presumably, was the stems, right? So the dialogue Correct. stem, the music stem, and maybe did yeah. you have a separate stem for effects and foley, or was that all combined into yes. one? Yes. Okay. Uh, they were five point one dialogue music effects foley backgrounds i see yeah and and i which which i was happy with for the most part but i really wanted to get hold of the of the effects units sure so um i knew i didn't have them because i'm just terrible at keeping stuff i actually have the mixes but i never kept the units so i called the sound team from the day and none of them had it I asked Universal to go back to their archive to see if they had it. They did not. And then the last person I tried was Gerard, who was my assistant, who's now not even in, he's in the Metropolitan Police Force. <laughs> and uh, I didn't have any contact details for him, but I tried him on Messenger, Facebook Messenger. And literally, I sent it one evening. The next morning, Gerard straight back. Yep, yeah, I've still got them. They're on a drive. And um, he sent them to me. And they were on Pro Tools 10, maybe? I mean, it was an old, it was an obviously 10-year-old um, format. And for the most part, it linked up. There was some stuff that I just couldn't link, um, uh, where I then flicked back to the stem if I couldn't, if there was stuff that I couldn't use from the unit. I'd flick back to the stem temporarily. And then the way that it was mixed, Doug Cooper was the original effects mixer. It was mixed on a Neve desk on an AMS Neve desk. So what I did was, the first thing I did was get it editorial as I, editorially as I wanted it to be. And then on the stage, I did one pass to match the mix to make sure that it was the mix that we all knew and loved. So for example, I think Doug must have used a lot of, like the reverbs and the sub were generated on the Neve desk. So I recreated those. And then once I'd done another pass of the movie that I was happy, this is the mix I know and love, but with the effects units, then I went back and started to have fun with putting um, certain things in the, in, the, in the objects, or even not even in the objects, just blooming it out and making it more uh, immersive. You know. So talk to me a little bit about what you did, um, you know, and what your approach was to to making the Dolby Atmos mix of the film for the for, you know, people who, who've been listening to it, uh, maybe theatrically and on home video for 10 years. You know, if they're able to go to a cinema and hear the, the film in Dolby Atmos and see it in Dolby Vision, what are they going to notice about the difference in the mix this time around? It's going to be 
all around you and enveloping. It is what it is what it is. You know, I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of cinema and I'm a big fan of um, being wrapped up in a sonic environment. So and that's what I wanted to do. So, for example, in the Roxy fight now, all those belt whips have been meticulously panned around the room and they're flying past you. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, it's just that thing of not trying to push it to a point that so it's a gimmick, but pushing it to a point that um, pulls you in to what's happening even more. And in fact, that was um, that was the comment. I, you know, I, I played it back to Edgar at Dolby in London at the back end of last year. And, you know, that was exactly his comment. He said, you know, it just it does that thing of it just pulls you into it that bit more. And, and you know, even the score, which, um, uh, you know, Nigel Godrich's score, which um, I only had the five one of, but I you know, I, I split it out into the, the six separate stems and bloomed them out into the room so that I'm, I'm quite a fan with Atmos of, and there are different schools of thought and, and um, there is no right or wrong way to do it, but I like the score coming off from the screen and being, you know, rather than just being a front forward uh, uh, thing that you're listening to where the screen is based, I like pulling it off and having fun with it. and. Um, you know, trying just to make it as all encompassing as as possible. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I I, I remember, you know, <laughs> when we introduce a new technology like Dolby Atmos and put it into the world, you kind of put it out there, and you, then you let artists start to play with it and experiment. And you never know really exactly what people are going to do. And one of the things that really surprised me there were a number of things that surprised me about introducing Dolby Atmos, but one of one of them was at least in the early days, like 2013, 14, there, thereabouts, when we first introduced the format, it seemed like the music departments were almost more eager to experiment with it than, than, than the sound effects folks. And I remember right. one of the things that really surprised us was exactly what you were saying. Like one of the things that we noticed was that music mixers were starting to pull the music just barely into the first speaker or two on the yeah. sidewalls and just barely into the overheads. And I think, first of all, it just created some more room in real estate in those front speakers so that, uh -huh. you know, then the whole thing becomes more articulate. But it also, to your point, it just kind of pulls you in a little bit more. Um, so you're, you're definitely not alone in that, in that approach. Yeah. And like I say, there is, that's the whole thing with sound, right? I, I'm, I'm trying to teach the next generation. I, I mean, or I've, I've kind of, there's a few people that I'm trying to teach the next generation. And, and as I explained to them, that the thing with sound is there is no right or wrong. It's all kind of up for interpretation. Um, but having said that, you know, I've heard some mixers say, well, you know, it, it belongs on the screen. You know, I'm not a fan of panning dialogue left, you know, for, for the sake of doing it. But I've heard some mixers say to me, well, the, the score should be where the orchestra is and just down the front and that's where it is. I, I personally don't, yes, sometimes, but equally, you know, I love, like I say, I love that, that feeling of being kind of wrapped around in, um, in sonic um, tapestry. You, uh, you mentioned um, the, the Roxy uh, fight in the nightclub. And I, I, was, uh, I was struck when I was listening to Edgar's interview about revisiting the film. And he, he also pointed that out as one of his favorite um, sequences. Um, but there are so many great, you know, so many great sequences to talk about in, in this film. And I'm sure you had a lot of fun revisiting, like, you know, well, first of all, you know, every fight scene is just amazing. You talked about the Matthew Patel, uh, fight scene in the club that really kind of, I think sets the tone for what you're going to do sonically and acoustically for the rest of the film. Um, and then can you talk about, uh, I'm sure you must've had a blast with the big climactic, um, chaos theater sequence uh, at the end of the film and the, the, the final kind of big showdown with Gideon. What, uh, uh, what was, what stands out in your memory as some fun parts of that, of that scene and going back and revisiting it? Well, I, we, tr we wanted to make each, uh, as much as they were visually different, we wanted each battle scene to be sonically different. So the punches in the Matthew Patel fight, for example, are different 
So the punches in the Matthew Vettel fight are very 8-bit like and game like, whereas the punches in the Lucas Lee, him being a big movie star, are very uh, Indiana Jones. So um, the end sequence was kind of like just this culmination of everything that we had done before it, and but without it sounding like a mishmash. Um, I do remember we finished the mix at uh, very early in the morning, like 4.30 in the, in, the, in the morning. So I was glad to finish it in the, in the nicest possible way. But, um, uh, and I also remember we, we were the first back into Delaney Lee after it had its fire, uh, which was 10 years ago. And we managed to blow up, we managed to blow up the base bin on one of the temps, <laughs> which, um, uh, you managed to they blew the roof off was the was the sequence <laughs> where, where we actually managed to blow the base bin well i'm just I, I i can't tell you how remarkable i find it that given you know you had this opportunity to go back in but the the the, the original work held up so well that you didn't you didn't you didn't go in and do any more foley you didn't add any more sound effects to it all the stuff was there it was just a matter of kind of giving it some more space and room to breathe yeah, totally. And, um, you know, and a shout out to Chris Burden and Doug Cooper, the two mixers, because in those 10 years, I've become a mixer. That's right. Um, I just sat through and what the first thing I did was put it up on the dub stage on dub stage six here at Warner Brothers and just listened to it and was like, my God, they did an amazing job. I mean, you know, just a really solid mix. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't. I, I, I don't know how, if there had been something that I felt should have been changed, there would have been an internal kind of, oh, is it right to do it? Is it not right to do it? But there wasn't at all. It was all just, let's just take what's there and have some fun with it and make it something that people are going to feel they're going to get their money's worth and when they go and see it and hear it um, at the cinema. Yeah, that's amazing. So yeah. I, I know um, you've... Um... You've said that you not only did the theatrical Atmos remix, but you also got the time to do a home uh, video Atmos pass as well. So can you talk to me about like, what's the difference between the two and what, are, what were you, you know, what adjustments did you have to make to do the home video pass uh, for Atmos as opposed to the theatrical? I try and do as little as possible to the home Atmos mix, but equally one is aware that um people it's it is a different format um the at the very least you just want to make sure that people aren't having to turn up and turn down their tv because there is something you know i'm here on a stage doing a near field mix of a movie that i finished last week and there is something kind of strange that does happen you go to small speakers and the first thing that happens is the dialogue just doesn't have the punch that it does when you're theatrical and so and I still can't even explain why that is because they're the, it's, you know, it's just all the speakers are the same in this room, but smaller. It's not like the center speaker is a different kind of um, speaker. And so the first thing I want to do is to make sure, because it annoys the hell out of me when I'm watching at home, that every single word is you can hear easily and not having to reach for. And then the next thing I do is just do a pass whereby um, you know, the general, the overall level of the show is perhaps a little contained compared to the theatrical so that, you know, you're not, um, they're not having to, the audience are not having to reach for their remotes to turn things down for the loud bits as well. So, um, but other than that, other than that, and there's not a huge amount that's done, I try and keep the, um, the integrity of the theatrical mix as much as possible. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great capstone to the conversation and, 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 uh, uh, want to just remind everybody, uh, where it's safe to do so to go out to, uh, go out to the cinema and watch Scott Pilgrim in the re-release and Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. It's going to be a spectacular experience. Yeah. Thanks so for we, me. we did, uh, we put out on social media a call for some questions and I, there are a couple that came in that I wanted to, to pose to you. Uh, Raymond Lowe asks, I think this is an interesting sort of, uh, sound design question. When do you know there are too many layers of sound and when sounds, when, when, when it, the mix gets too complex, 
what, how do you make decisions about what to do? It is all an experiment is what I would say. And this is what I'm trying to teach some people who I'm trying to get into the, into the industry. Um, even after now 30 years of experience, I, it still surprises me when, uh, when someone else points out to me that there is that we need to strip stuff away you know it's not like i'm a, an amazing kind of god of sound who can sit there and know everything all the time uh as to what needs to be done it's a it's a it's a team sport so um but there is a sweet spot there is no doubt as i said before it's you know it's it's everyone's opinions sound is very much kind of how you think a sound should be and how i think a sound should be could be completely different but there comes a moment where on that needle where both of us go, ah, that's it. And um, that's, 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 that's when you know, you know, there's, and sometimes you can identify it very easily with a frequency as in there's too much low end going on here. It's an EQ thing. And sometimes it's a content thing. And sometimes you see it very early on, like uh, either in the design stage or on the mix stage, it comes up and it's like, okay, first pass through. Okay, we need to do this. We need to do that. We need to change this. Sometimes it doesn't happen until the last playback of the print master, as your Dolby guys will uh, will uh, attest to. You know, you know, in theory, the print master is just to record down and watch it through, but it's not. You you look at it and you're like, ah, ah, ah I've got it now. Um, not normally at that late stage, but it surprises me. It takes a while for things to filter through, but eventually, you know, if the room agrees or the key members of the team agree and see it for what it needs to be, that's when you kind of identify it when, you know, maybe, and sometimes less is more. There's no doubt about it. It's not just about layering sounds. It's not about um, uh, the more, the better, not, not at all. Uh, here's a uh, question from Miguel Guerrera. What do you see, what's the hardest part of getting your first Foley or sound effects job in the industry? I tell them, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, seriously, and, and, I, and I mean it. There's, um, I've been through, she contacted me on, um, I guess it was email. There's a young girl in Scotland who I've been speaking to who is a film student. And um, she's she was amazed that I took the time to speak to her and we've had a few Zooms, you know, over the course of the last year. And she said to me, she said, but how do I, you know, how do on earth do I come out of a, of a town in Scotland and work in the industry that you work in? And my point is, I come from a small town in the east of England and uh, currently every day I walk through the fine gates of Warner Brothers studio. And um, there's some luck, there's determination, um, but it's not in any way something that is unachievable. And um, if, if you have the will to do it and the application um, and a great attitude, the good, the good thing about our industry is the, the cream rises to the top. So be great at what, if you want to do it, be great at what you do and you will get there. That's my advice. I think that's great. I think that's a great way to go out on Julian Slater. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a while since we had you on the show. The last time you were on with Edgar, I think you guys had just finished working on Baby Driver, and uh, that was a really great conversation. And it's great to have you on again and revisiting Scott Pilgrim. Really fun. Thanks, Glenn. It was lovely to speak with you, and um, uh, let's do it again at some point in the future. At, well, we may have another movie to talk about fairly soon, as I understand it. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to the next one with that, with like the next collaboration between you and Edgar. Yeah, thank you. Um, great to chat. Thanks for your Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks again to Julian and Edgar for joining us today. And thank you to Universal Pictures for helping bring these conversations together. Be sure to check out Scott Pilgrim vs. The World once it reaches a Dolby Cinema or a home theater near you. We'll be back again in two weeks, so make sure you are subscribed if you're not already. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please consider leaving us a rating or a review on the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps raise awareness of our podcast so that we can continue to grow. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been the Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry. 
Production support by Taylor Hines, and our production coordinator is Tristan Enriquez. Thank you for listening.